Cyfnosfaith dda a chroeso i'n digwyddiad mam iaith iaith frodorol, barddoniaeth a thrafodaeth i ddathlu diwrnod rhyngwladol mam iaith UNESCO 2021, a drefnwyd ar y cyd rhwng Wales Pen Cymru a Chyfnewydfa Lein Cymru, gyda chefnogaeth prifysgol Cymru y Drinda Dewi Sant, Cyngor Celfyddydau Cymru, y Gymdeithas Dysgedig a Pen Rhyngwladol. Good evening and welcome to our event, Mother Tongue, Indigenous Languages, Poetry and Debate to Celebrate UNESCO's International Mother Language Day 2021, organised jointly by Wales Pen Cymru and Wales Literature Exchange, with the support of the University of Wales Trinity St David, Arts Council of Wales, the Learned Society of Wales and Pen International. Cari le gydwi a dwi'n swyddog prosiectau gyda'r Chyfnewydfa Lein Cymru a Llenyddiaeth ar draws ffiniau. I'm Cari Lake and I'm the Projects Officer for Wales Literature Exchange and Literature Cross Frontiers. As part of the celebrations for UNESCO's International Mother Language Day this year, an international poetry project was planned by Penn International's Community for Translation and Linguistic Rights under the leadership of the chair, Urzio Rutico Ercea. The project includes poems by poets all over the world, reading their poetry in their own mother tongue. A number of the languages in this project are minority and official ones and in a very precarious position. The poems can be found on the committee's Facebook page and on YouTube with subtitles in English, French or Spanish. The president of Penn Cymru, Mena Elvin, has contributed a poem in Welsh to the project and Mena will be reading that poem later on. So the order of the evening is a poetry to begin with, with Mena Elvin and Greek Muse, and then a discussion on the theme of mother language and indigenous languages with Ned Thomas and Ellen Hart Griffith Jones, and then poetry to close with Ivor Aptlin and Sean Northey. First, we shall turn to Mena Elvin and Greek Muse. Mena Elvin is a poet and a dramatist, and her poetry has been translated into over 20 languages. She is president of Wales Pen Cymru and a very active president. She will be reading Nebach, the poem which is part of the Pen International's Mother Language Poetry Project and the English translation. Greek Muse is a poet, editor, and a PhD student, winner of the 2020 Translation Challenge. She is also one of the founders and editors of the magazine A Stamp. Holwy Ddore Gariaeth, Catechism on Language, is the title of Greek's poem, a poem commissioned by the Learned Society of Wales for their symposium on bilingualism and multilingualism through the prism of language last November. Thank you, Mena and Greek. Here is the poem Nebach. It's a word from Yiddish. And when I came across the word, I thought it was a very interesting one indeed in Welsh. That is to say neb plus ach, neb meaning nobody, and ach meaning uh, being related to someone, to say the no one who is related. So I wrote this when I saw the minorities being scattered, leaving their countries and looking to better themselves. One of the first words I learned in Welsh was the word bach, small, and I make a play on that word as well. This will be translated by the author herself immediately afterwards, I believe.
a word from Yiddish. And I wrote a translation after having written the Welsh version. Nebish is also a word used. And here is the epigraph that I wrote when writing the translation. So many of us have stood up for the marginalized, but never expected to be here ourselves. Barbara Kingsolver. or other of England sometimes quipped as Great Britain, although minuscule on any map. Welsh is the only language you learn to be able to talk to fewer people, said one spin doctor or the journalist this useless language, though she could not sound even a syllable from her small world. Bigger, bigger, bigger is the curse that we hear. These days, the small and smaller are afoot, and we are with them, the smallest ones, dregs, whose here I for half, wants a roof, bondo, ease even, and blessings, who crave, though they be small, a feast, a dwelling, a plenitude, and we, like them, shy away from those who sense the leaves on our lips. After all, we Welsh, were called strangers once by our next door neighbours. So we understand those on the move, mumbling without the warmth of their mother tongue, glass wort on a faraway beach, hard hitting rocks before it falls in the cauldron of tides. Until the great power reconfigure their dictionaries as the diminutive people, small, small, the smallest nebbish, a nobody, nebach, no lineage, smaller than small. Poor thing, say some, as they bid or do, to the whisper of the tiniest tribes and nations, before slipping back to their huge world, larger than ever, ever, ever. Thank you, Mena. That was lovely. Can I ask Grieg now to read her poem? Yeah. Um, so, the title of this is and it is in the form of question and answer. Cwysau yn taro byrddau mewn stafelloedd tywyll. Ystyriwch, pe byddan ni yn dall yn gilydd, be fyddan ar ôl i'w ddeud. A yw hon yn iaith? Mae nhw'n dweud i bod hi, nid pawb. Mae rhai neu gwadu i gael hwn sŵn neu rhyw beth marw. Rwy'n casglu pethau marw. Am ond nid, penglogau a dar bach a brigair un, hen fatris, beiros gwag, Ei rhoi mewn bocsu sgidiad yn y gwely, yn fath o ofer gwyliaeth. 3. Beth aeth cyn iaith? Nid tawelwch, na, ond sŵn. Y ffasiwn ddwndwr, dŵr yn llifol a'r cyn entydd, gwynt mewn sgyfaint, mellt ar y mynyddoedd a rhew yn gwylliam, mewiam bwncath, chwyban pri, cyriad esgill cydell i'ch ben cors, a sisial sglyfrod mor. Pedwar... Beth aw wedi iaith? Mae iaith, meddwn nhw, fel gwastraff niwclear. Ar ôl yr adwaith gynta, y creu mawr, y gwres a'r dinister, mae'r stwff na sy'n gwrthod marw. Er ei gladdu'n ddofn, ei alltudio wyneb hael a gwres y ser. Mae y tomau fod yn dal i gnoni, yn dal i droi a throsi, hyd yn oed o'i beddau dofn. Mae nhw'n gwgu, yn gwrthod pydru. Diolch. Thank you very much, Greg. Professor Elin Hav Griffith Jones is the new director of the Centre for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies in the University of Wales. And she has specialised in the area of European minority languages through her work with Mercator for three decades. 
Ned Thomas, journalist and author, a critic and scholar, the founder of Mercator and of Planet, the Welsh internationalist in 1970, and it celebrated 50 years last year. We shall now turn to Elena Ned to guide us through this discussion on mother language and indigenous languages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. We are here to mark the International Day of uh, Mother Tongues of UNESCO, and we are on the threshold of UNESCO's uh, Day of uh, Decade of Indigenous Languages, and that follows uh, an international year of um, Indigenous Languages in uh, 2019. And so, in participating in international programmes such as this, it's important for us to ask, it's appropriate for us to ask in Wales what the purpose and meaning of those terms is for us today as people who belong to the Welsh language and people to whom the Welsh language belongs. If we think initially about the term uh, indigenous languages, well, our question is which languages are indigenous languages and are there any languages which are not indigenous languages? If Welsh is an indigenous language, and Basque is an indigenous language, Catalan uh, likewise, and Breton and so on. Uh, are Danish and Swedish and Hungarian and German and French and English also indigenous languages? The continuum of indigenous languages, if we look at it in that sense, includes all languages, but UNESCO's definition is not as broad as that. UNESCO defines indigenous languages as indigenous peoples, that is to say peoples, about 500 million people, less than 5% of the population of the world. And it is those indigenous peoples who carry an enormous responsibility with regard to maintaining the linguistic diversity of the world. But of course, 40% of the world's population do not have any access to education in their own indigenous language. So the responsibility that rests upon those indigenous peoples who are defined by UNESCO as indigenous peoples is enormous. Why do we then, who stand outside that block of uh, indigenous peoples, why do we as speakers of Welsh, as people who have a relationship with other languages that are endangered, why do we want to take part in this decade and in this year that has gone by? Perhaps one of the reasons why we have, why we are so keen to do so is that we believe that we are people who have a high level of awareness of the importance of language in the world, that we are people who wish to demonstrate our solidarity in a linguistic sense, and that we are people who want to play a part in the maintenance of uh, linguistic diversity in the world. So perhaps that's why we go into the decade of indigenous languages held by UNESCO, that we are not taking on a vocabulary that does not belong to us, but that we are standing together with people across the world who are campaigning and fighting for their languages and who contribute to linguistic diversity throughout the whole world. And if we think about the term mother tongue, well, perhaps this also is a complex and wide ranging discussion, perhaps more so. I look at myself, uh, my mother tongue is Welsh, that's quite simple. But over the years, uh, the words of uh, colleagues and neighbors and people that I know are, on the question of what mother tongue is, what is your mother tongue, those words have left quite an impression upon me. And I think, Ned, I'm thinking back to a former colleague of ours in Mercator in the early days, the Breton Philippe Jacques, who is now head of Office of Raisonnic in Brittany. And when he was a young man in his 20s, he had learnt Breton as an adult. And I remember him saying, uh, Breton is not the language of my mother and so Breton is not my mother tongue but Breton is my language and those words have remained with me that he had chosen Breton as his main language as his mother tongue although Breton was not the language of his mother 
And then 30 years later, I remember having a conversation with Georgia Ruth, the uh, singer and also a former neighbor of mine as it happens. And she spoke about her role in the project by Wales Arts International, uh, Mother Tongue, during 2019. And Georgia noted that Welsh was not the language of her mother and that it was therefore not her mother tongue, but it was that Welsh was her language as a mother and therefore the mother tongue of her son. That's little, those two little examples highlight the fact that mother tongue is something that on the one hand seems simple and concrete and factual, but on the other hand, that the significance of the term is so complex and because of course we live in a world where people can lose fluency in their language, are not able to maintain and develop fluency in their mother tongue as they grow as people. And that there are emotional elements also in the sense that we can choose which language would become our mother tongue and are able to create a new emotional relationship with a language that we develop during our lives. And of course, for multilingual people, and particularly for those who are multilingual early in their lives, which mother tongue? Perhaps we have more than one mother tongue, more than one emotional mother tongue, even if we live in a state where we have to uh, set which is our mother tongue for censuses and so on, such as happens to the Swedes in Finland, or for that matter, the Finnish speaking population in Finland, they have to lay down which is their mother tongue. But we know also that there are so many people who give their life's work to working for a language that was not technically their mother tongue. And we know also of people who have developed co-creativity in a language again, which is not technically their mother tongue. Uh, I think of Waldo Williams and the depth of his poetry in Welsh although Welsh was not technically his mother tongue. And more recently, perhaps, uh, we think of a singer such as Steve Eaves, who has contributed so much to the uh, Welsh language rock scene, doing so in a language which is not technically his mother tongue. We all live, do we not, in periods of time where the world takes us, uh, factors more powerful than ourselves can make decisions for us and make this relationship between mother tongue, our language, uh, the, our languages of expression, uh, our emotional languages. It's difficult for us to be masters of our own fate uh, in a linguistic sense. Uh, I have spoken perhaps from the perspective of mother tongue as something individualistic, but Ned, you are going to approach this subject from a different perspective. Well, yes, I am. Um, because everything you have spoken about is true, starting from the individual and in every family, almost in Wales, whatever the family language may be, there are layers. If you look back with languages other than English, in between Welsh and English, but that is very interesting. And also the individuals have a kind of archeology span sometimes uh, from different periods where one language takes over from another. But I want to follow up on mother tongue when one says in the mother language, they don't mean the individual one, uh, they mean that of the group. Who is the group? Well, there are circles, the family, the neighborhood, perhaps the nation, the diaspora, particularly these days with the internet and so on. They are part of the group. Does it mean the same thing as the nation? Well, hardly if you think of Patagonia or English being everywhere as a first language as well as a second language. Um, I think following Raymond Williams' pattern in keywords that it's interesting and helpful to understand the present to go back to the history of the use 
of the terms that the group use in relation to language. According to the University of Wales Dictionary, I think it was in 1607 that the word mamiaith, mother tongue, comes up first. But if you go back about four centuries before that, they talked of people who were kavyaith of the same language and anghavyaith, not of the same language. So there is an idea there of belonging to the group, that is the group, our group or their group. I don't think that that myself is the same as feeling like a nation in the modern sense of the word. We are very prepared to kill others and for people who did not speak the same language to kill those who did. Those things did not go together. The idea of nation and state and um, politics followed monarchs and so on, but there was an awareness of who had the same language as us. And then of course, Kavyaith of the same language suggests to us today Kavyaithi, that is to translate, the verb to translate, to make it into our language, to, to make it Welsh and so on, um, the same idea. In Latin, quite a long way back, the same time as the University of Wales Dictionary indicates Kavyaith and Anghavyaith, lingua materna, that is to say, there you have it, the, the mother tongue, but when you look at the context in which that is used, what it means is not Latin on the whole. And then it, it does not go into detail. A lingua materna is something different. Languages, dialects, people had not categorized languages as we do anyway. So it tended also to mean um, oral languages and Welsh is special in having a, quite an early written tradition. So even in some of the examples I've seen, there was a, a deprecatory element to some extent to lingua materna. It was mainly women and children who spoke and they on the whole, well, there were exceptions of course, uh, and famous ex exceptions, but they were less literary, literate than many men in the period in the church. It was men who held the uh, functions in the church. So where things change then with the Protestant Reformation, and there, there was the need for people to understand the Bible in their own language, and we know how that has influenced uh, the life of Wales, but alongside more or less in the same period in the Renaissance, you have people such as the humanists, the Welsh-speaking humanists and everywhere, uh, wanted to enrich uh, the languages very often uh, by translation. And uh, there was praise for uh, the language, the, the mother tongue. And that's where the early quote that the, the first quote that the uh, well, University of Wales Dictionary has talks about the delightful, uh, mellifluous uh, Welsh language. Uh, and that is 1607, and it shows the desire to praise the language and to enrich it and to respect it. But unfortunately, the second example that the dictionary quotes a little later in the middle of the same century is to complain that people, I have it here, that it says my fellow countrymen uh, deprecate our old mother tongue. So if you didn't have a state to support and a court to standardize the language and uh, and resources to pay scholars and so on. It was efforts of individuals such as Griffith Roberts in Milan and so on to do a Welsh grammar. Well, Welsh was halfway, but this deprecation had begun. And then when you come to Romanticism, uh, political and linguistic Romanticism begins in Germany and spreads out from there, then it is the nation 
that's, that is the language. It is language which defines the nation. And we live still in the shadow of, of that philosophy, which has very positive elements. The appreciation of heritage, territory, the language, it, it is all a unit. There's quite a negative aspect because it, it was a tool for the big languages, the states, the powerful states, to unite their territories around what was called the national language, the language of the state, of course, and it allowed them to possess territories where people spoke the same language, they, whether they wished to join or not. And, and it led to wars at the same time. It was a tool in the hands of people like the Welsh, uh, Welsh-speaking Welsh, to ask for the same respect, because in Romanticism, it was the, the, the same qualities were central, uh, linguistically speaking, to all uh, nations. Well, for you and me, Ellen, we come into this discussion in the 20th, in the second half of the 20th century. I am a little ahead of you. Uh, so I am, I just belong as a child to the generation that said at the end of the World War, never again. And we, uh, people who were adults when I was a child, it was they who established institutions which became the European Union, the common market and so on. They were federalists basically because they had felt the power of the center in the case of Hitler and Mussolini in particular. And many of them were Italians from the side that had opposed uh, Mussolini. They did not wish to centralize power any for any longer. So it was from there that the first uh, 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 proposal came into the um, uh, European Parliament from Arfe to do something for the minority languages. Now, these people, and of course, in the case of Germany, a federal constitution was imposed in order not to have another Hitler in the center. These people, in fact, saw Europe developing in a federal way, but it was not possible in the period, the post-war period, to think about redrawing boundaries or creating new borders because that was what had led to war. So they focused on the areas that we know as that we were partially involved in developing. That was not to talk about uh, territories, but to talk simply of languages. And the areas were education, administration, that you were one could deal with the authorities in one's own language. You could have education in your own language. And the media, and we in Aberystwyth, or in the Mercator circuit, uh, we specialized on, on in the media. But in a way, it was a proxy federalism because to have linguistic rights, uh, someone has to designate the territory uh, to which the uh, rights apply. And so that's how I see the history of our time. And now, of course, we have uh, a period that has developed further. And you, Ellen, have been involved with a more recent charter than the ones that I remember. Uh, and of course, the situation of Britain and Wales uh, has you know, obliged us to go outside the uh, framework, particularly the legislative framework. It doesn't mean that we cannot be within the European framework uh, through cultural links, but it is a blow because what characterizes the European Union more than attempts, the, uh, the attempts of, to maintain connections was that there was some 
legal force to what they passed to maintain in terms of democracy, in terms of uh, rights of members and so on. But, well, I have spoken too much now, so uh, back to you. Well, one thing that I should like to say in response to what you have just said now, thinking about the languages that we call minority languages of Europe, is that there is quite a clear division when it comes to thinking about the concept of mother tongue. There are a number of languages, a number of linguistic communities, which place great emphasis on the mother tongue, which define populations according to their mother tongue. I have referred to the Swedes in Finland, but also in South Tyrol or in Northern Italy, depending from which perspective one looks at uh, that part of the world. Once again, people are defined from birth uh, according to what their parents set down for them as their mother tongue. Now, in Finland also, it's possible for you to change later on as an adult, if you wish. You can um, restate your mother tongue, but it is set when you are born, and that, that then leads to which uh, educational stream you go into. And of course, that's one part of the minority language perspective, those who place this emphasis on what exactly your mother tongue is. And then we have the other uh, stream of minority languages, which look at uh, collective questions according to identity and civic identity and so on. And we know also, with regard to the tradition now in Wales, in the Basque country, Catalonia and so on, for people to be educated mainly in a language which is not technically their mother tongue. And that access to this collective mother tongue does not depend on what your parents have determined is your mother tongue from the very beginning. So the terminology also we refer in Wales, we can refer to Welsh as the language proper to Wales or the language which belongs to Wales, even thinking that most of the population are not able to speak that language. We can say that the Welsh language belongs to everyone, even if you are not able to speak it. That is to say that there's a relationship of a collective kind with language, even if you yourself are not fluent in it or anywhere near being fluent in it. And that sense is one which is shared with the Basques, the Catalans, the Bretons and so on, but not uh, to the same extent with the uh, linguistic minorities where there is a mother country where the language is a majority one and so on. And if we just look at how the terminology in Catalonia has changed over the decades, began in the 80s with uh, Catalan as the language proper to Catalonia, and now that language pro that's proper to Catalonia still exists, but Catalan is now defined as lengua de cohesión social, the language of social cohesion. So it is the language which brings everyone together. It doesn't matter where they have come from originally. So this division, I think, is interesting between those who place one kind of emphasis on mother tongue and others who place a very different kind of emphasis on the idea of mother tongue. I don't know, Ned, whether you would wish to say one or two things to close. Uh, switching on the microphone first, of course. Um, what you have just said is very close in minority terms to what majority languages have been saying, that it's a, a means of assimilation, but one hopes not to assimilate in a way which is inhuman. Everyone who has state or even an embryonic state, in a sense, needs a national language in the sense of a language in which everyone can be equal. That can be oppressive, as we have experienced. And so one has to be very careful. And I think 
we have to be very careful that it is uh, a matter of by invitation and not by obligation. But we have to be particularly careful if you are 20% of the population as the Welsh speaking Welsh. Uh, we are fortunate that, that a significant percentage of the non-Welsh speaking population consider themselves to be Welsh people, but that it does not necessarily follow from the fact that they live in Wales. It follows from historical factors. And there are areas perhaps where people do not feel to the same extent that they are Welsh, although they live on their territory. So creating any state or embryonic state creates minorities as well uh, as well and so it's a process that's, which is complex and something which where tact is need, linguistic tact is needed and policy to deal with it but i agree that there's that difference where language is still where a language is still a sort of minority because there is another language which claims the same rights as that language such as in the south tyrol you will even find ambulances for the people who speak german and ambulances for those who speak italian because uh, adherence to the linguistic group, the fear of losing territory, uh, that's very different. And uh, Finland and Swedish in Finland, that's different again. But very often in the background, in both of those cases, there was something like a civil war. They have come to the rules, uh, and, and likewise in Belgium, from the bitter experience of something like a civil war and then uh, understood that there had to be particular rules for living together and we are very fortunate that we are not starting from a place like that but nevertheless our problems are different and of course that's the experience that we've had or the things that we can learn from other situations and uh, the terms. I think it was Ellen who brought the term Priodiaith, the language proper to Wales. Um, I remember the language board in a primitive period saying Priodiaith, uh, that is not a term, it must be a term that they've invented somewhere in Gwynedd, but it was in Catalonia and the Basque country that it was invented and imported then by Ellen. Uh, so, well, I'm sure someone used it before me in the context of Welsh, but it was reintroduced. Uh, it was an import. Um, but I think as we bring this uh, conversation to a close now, Ned, one of the things that has struck me during the period where the International Day of Mother Tongues uh, is being celebrated throughout the world. One of the things that has struck me is a brief quote from David Hicks, who is a speaker of Cornish and who is also General Secretary of the organization ELN, European Language Equality Network. And what he had to say, and it struck me, was that it is not we who are revitalizing our languages but our languages which revitalize us and i think that that perhaps is something for us to consider as we bring this uh, conversation to a close so thank you very much for your company ned and thank you well thank you very much indeed uh, ellen and ned for that uh, very lively discussion now more poetry uh, Ivor Atkin has been Wales's national poet since 2015, 
and has been a very busy cultural ambassador, ambassador by raising the profile of Welsh writers across the world and representing Welsh literature abroad. And Dr. Shan Northey is a poet, an author, an editor and translator. And can I now invite Ivor and Shan to share their poetry with us? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There has already been reference made to the fact that the year 2019 was a designated International Year of Indigenous Languages. And to mark the launch of that year here in Wales back in January 2019, I was asked to write the poem that I am going to share with you now. And of course, as we are concerned with the condition of indigenous languages, minority languages, or whatever terminology we may use, one feels concerned as to how these languages are to be maintained. And certainly I'm not interested any more than anyone else here, I'm sure, in this discussion, uh, in keeping Welsh as some kind of mere ornament, um, a beautiful thing, but one that is not to be used and that, that has ceased to be a living medium. Of course, what Welsh should be is a, a vessel for, um, a, an everyday vessel for our experiences. And the Cherokees have a, a lovely saying which speaks of transmitting a language as one would uh, with a dish from one generation to the next. And of course, one is encouraged not to drop the dish because once it's gone, it's gone. So with that in mind, I begin the poem with a Latin quote, which was a language I studied for about seven years in school. I studied German for three years. I learned to read the one and to speak the other. So you can guess which I can still speak and the other I have more or less entirely forgotten. So Lisha, voicing. Nomina se pereunt, perit et cognitio rerum. If the names are lost, our knowledge of things dies too. So pray tell us, enlightened ones, how is language to be saved? Not by consecration or annotation, not by locking words down like sticky burrs to jazz the writing of those who prowl our perimeters. Such book Welsh is but a stuffed fox. Its mid-air paw will move no more. Its glassy eyes unseeing. Its verve comes from being voiced. And on children's tongues, it will live on. Thank you. Chan. Well, you said not by a consecration or annotation, and perhaps that's what is in this poem too. But it's in those um, almost trivial little sentences that are only uttered once that the beauty and the magic is found. And the background is that I had a chance to go as somebody's plus one to Sadar in Croatia, an invitation my companion had had to a conference called Provisa, I think, um, perspectives on language sustainability, discoveries, policies and practices. And in Satar, if you've ever been there, uh, there is what is called a, a sea organ at the far end of the prom. There are wide stone steps going down to the sea and under them is a system of pipes and empty spaces. And as the waves strike, it makes the most amazing sounds. The Zatar sea organ, Academics and their PowerPoint presentations disclosing the decline, the death, the disappearance of the world's small languages. They bewail, they offer salvation, and if not salvation, embalming fluid to preserve the words for posterity. And then when evening comes, after feasting on silver fish and drinking wine and beer, they wander northward along the prom to the organ, there they marvel at its sounds, the never before heard sounds, not heard until this specific wave reached the pipes. 
an arrangement of notes that will never be heard again, an arrangement unrecorded by anyone or anything. Thank you. So there's something else from Ivar now, I think. Imagine a conversation like this around a dinner table in London. Guess what? He's the next door, he's just moved here from Norway, and he's learning English. How about that, then? Well, of course, it's not a conversation that you're likely to hear, but of course, here in Wales, if someone were to move to us from whatever country it might be, we would be very pleased and proud if there were an attempt to uh, become familiar with our language. And in that sense, whether it comes from a sense of inferiority or some... Um, keenness to see hope for our language uh, to continue or perhaps even a sign that it is not as an indigenous language that we think of, of Welsh because of course we welcome speakers from whatever background whatever may be the case about that I think it's important we are able to um, maintain this connection with other lesser used languages, and indigenous languages, and of course, Ned and Elin and many others have been leading that discussion for decades. Uh, and that enriches our experience. And recently, I was a small part of a, a project with a poet a Scottish Gaelic poet who's able to speak Scottish Gaelic um, and an Irish speaking poet. So quality, grind, quality is the name of this next poem. It talks about the importance of not making a fetish of the standard of language and I have some personal experience of that, that's another story. But here we have it, good quality. If sometimes I'm blessed with the tang of seasoned oak in the telling, each sentence neatly dovetailing those well-honed words smooth beneath my hand, it's a different thrill to hear our language self-assembled with flat pack mutations, confident not included, because both will do the job. For most of us, however, who lie somewhere between the two, sometimes short of the big flash words, or not asked to keep it Cymraeg through and through, we still have to keep our tools sharp. That's maybe our biggest test, not blowing away like sawdust clouds the slang of the less well expressed. Thank you. Well, I want to finish with a poem that talks about how fragile our grasp is, not just as a society, but as individuals, uh, our grasp on any language is. It comes from work that I did with people living with dementia, and they are certainly people for whom uh, a mother tongue can be very important, and care in their mother tongue can be exceptionally important for them. Bodawen is the name of one of the residential homes that I visited during the project. After a visit to Bodawen, sometimes we, she and I, would see them escaping, sliding away to their freedom between the carpet swirls, in the folds of the curtains and amongst their friends on the radio. And then they had to be surrounded with the lasso of description, not a horse, bigger than a sheep. We drag them back to their rightful place in our mouths, a cow? Yes, a cow. A word corralled. Our conversation continues. And as I walk home, I name my world like a toddler, in case the crafty buggers slip too soon to hide in the, what do you might call it, at the side of the road. Thank you very much. Well, what a way to finish. Thank you very much, Ivar uh, Chan. And with that, I will, um, as I bring the evening to a close, I thank you all again, uh, the poets, for your time and your words, Ellen and Ned, 
for planning the evening and uh, for the discussion and Manon James for the technical help behind the scenes as it were. Thank you very much indeed.